and welcome to Single Track Fresh Goods Down Under live. We're live on YouTube and it's Friday morning here in Australia in Bendigo. And uh, if you're watching from the UK, welcome, hello, and uh, happy Thursday evening. I think it is there, if I <laughs> remember correctly. Sorry, I'm a little bit underslept at the moment. The, uh, the heat the last few days here has been absolutely oppressive. And, uh, and I've not been sleeping terribly well. Boohoo, wah wah, whatever. So I just reposition this lovely decor frame here. Um, welcome to Fresh Goods Friday Live. And um, I'm gonna run through a bunch of products today. We're gonna have a bit of a chat about mountain biking in general. We've got people tuning in there at the moment. Hello, welcome. Um, as usual, please, um, by all means, answer any questions you've got here. I can see your questions on the screen in front of me, right down the bottom here. So, um, so please ask me any questions you've got about the stuff we're going to look at today um, and also if you've got any other general questions, please drop them in the bottom um, section below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Um, one thing I would love to know right now is for those people who are tuning in now who are watching live, I'd love to know where in the world you're watching from but I'd also like to know how hot or how cold it is where you're watching from. Um, please tell me, I'd love to know. The reason I say that is we've had a bit of a mini heat wave this week um, in Australia in general, I think across the whole of the country, um, but, I, but speaking more locally in Bendigo, oh, we've got uh, PR Ros steel frame. Maybe it is, yes. I, uh, you may have heard of De Kerf before. Uh, this is actually not a fresh good. This is a very old good De Kerf. I think this is back to front for you guys. I'm not entirely sure. Um, this is not a fresh good, it is a retro uh, good that uh, my good friend Ben has recently acquired. Um, if he's watching this live at the moment, Ben can let us know um, all the details about this because I know nothing. Oh Callum, welcome, thanks for tuning in Callum. North Yorkshire and bloody freezing. Is it literally freezing? Is it zero degrees at the moment in North Yorkshire? Um, I can tell you how <laughs> hot it's been here in Australia. Um, or at least in Bendigo anyway. So Monday we hit 40 degrees. I thought, oh, was it 40 degrees? Yes. Tuesday was 41. And then Wednesday we hit 43 degrees. Yesterday it cooled off and we hit 38 degrees, which was quite pleasant relative to the plus 40 degrees we'd had several days before. Last night at midnight, I was still checking emails on my phone in bed because I couldn't sleep. And at midnight it was 28 degrees Celsius. It was so hot. Um, it's still really warm now, um, but it's under 40 degrees, which as far as I'm concerned is quite pleasant. Oh, we've got a comment come through. Shed Life Guy, welcome to the, uh, to the um, show, Shed Life Guy. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Will. Have you heard of the Monkey Link system? Integrated lights and fenders using a Fidlock tech. And I'm freezing in Norfolk. Oh, <laughs> I'm uh, sorry to hear you're freezing in Norfolk, but to be honest, freezing right about now actually sounds really pleasant. Uh, it's, um, it's way too hot here. Um, I have not heard of the monkey link system, integrated lights and fenders using a Fidlock tech. Where is, is that a particular bike brand, Shed Life Guy, is that, um, or, a, or a component brand that's doing that? I've not heard of that. Um, I have been using the, excuse me, I have been using the Fidlock water bottle um, over the last um, year or so and it's been really, really good. So that's got the, the magnetic um, stubs that sit on the frame and then the receiver that's on the back side of the bottle and they just clip together, really, really nice. Um, so yeah, I, I know that they're using that technology and a bunch of other products. Uh, PR Ros is saying in Poland, Warsaw, plus three. Well, that also sounds quite pleasant right now. Um, three degrees. I assume that's Celsius. Uh, Fahrenheit would be very cold. <laughs> um, maybe it is Fahrenheit, three degrees. If you're in Warsaw, uh, I understand that's a very cold place. Uh, let me know if that's Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's slightly concerning. Oh, Celsius. Okay, that's all right then. Whew. <laughs> uh, that's a little colder than it is here. I think at the moment, oh, my, I don't know my phone, it's up there. Um, but I think it's um, around 28 degrees and it's nine o'clock in the morning or 8.30 in the morning. So yeah, bloody hot here, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah three degrees, I would take that right now, to be honest. Um, I think I slept for about three hours last night on my bed, soaked in sweat. It was really, really hot, really not sexy. <laughs> Um, so we should probably talk about some fresh goods here. Ooh, 
Shed Life Guy, you buy a seat clamp and or stem and everything clips onto the, these items. Ah, is, ah, interesting. I'm very interested in this. I'd love to see if you could put a link to this Shed Life Guy in the comments section. Um, if there's a link that we can follow to a news story or the product itself, uh, that sounds really interesting. I've not heard of it before, but I'd love to know more about it. Um, Chris Sangster's just tuning in and saying, I just rode back from college on my roadie and about two degrees. Brr, that does sound really cold, actually. Is it, um, are you getting much ice over your way? Black ice, oof, that is terrifying. I think the first winter I had in the UK, I didn't realize basically how dangerous black ice was. I have a great story for you actually, and, and anyone from single track from the office who's watching this will have a great laugh because sub-zero temperatures are just not something we run into that much here. Um, I mean, it does get cold in Bendigo, but it, it doesn't get that cold very often. Um, and I remember the first winter I had in the UK and I was working at the single track office and I had to wash a test bike because uh, it was, um, I think it was being picked up later that day or something. So I took the bike outside the front of the office to the area that we always wash bikes, just out on, basically on the, on the, uh, the footpath next to the road against the wall. So I was washing the bike, you know, cleaning all the mud off it. It was freezing. I had gloves on, I had a beanie on, I had two jackets on, a raincoat, you know, trousers, everything. I was just freezing anyway. And I had to get this job done, clean the bike, cool, went back inside, went upstairs, check my emails, drinking my coffee. And about 20 minutes later, Chips comes into the office. And I mean, there's about eight of us there working in the office. And he goes, has anyone been washing bikes this morning? And I was like, yeah, that was me. I washed a test bike. Um, you know, what's up? And he goes, do you know you've created a death trap outside on the footpath? And I thought, what do you mean? And he goes, come, come with me. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So he went downstairs and the side of the footpath next to the wall that I washed this bike is covered in thick frozen ice. It was about minus three degrees that day, maybe minus four degrees at that point in the morning. And basically all the water that I'd been washing with the hose on this bike had just created this huge icicle over the footpath. And uh, yeah, it was slippery AF. So um, if anyone did slip over and hurt themselves that day and is watching this, I'm really sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> this is a new thing for an Australian to experience. So, uh, so there you go. That's my funny story about uh, nearly killing someone on the footpath in Tomadon next to the single track office. <laughs> but anyway, let's, um, that's, it's very British of me to start out this video talking about the weather. Um, but I feel like it's, it's, it's a worthwhile topic at the moment because I understand the UK, you guys are going through a bit of a cold patch and we're going through a bloody hot patch at the moment. So, so there you go. Um, let me know if you've got any questions about stuff here. Oh, Ben Walburn, he's tuning in. He is watching live. So if anyone wants to know about this orange frame, this is a beautiful De Kerf Solitaire. So Ben is actually just giving us the details. Uh, handmade in Canada from around 2006. Uh, single speed specific 26 inch disc frame soon to be reborn as a single speed gravel with flat bars and 700 by 38 tires. Um, if anyone else out there, if you're familiar with De Kerf, I mean, you'll, you'll know straight away by this very distinctive wishbone system on the, the back of the frame. How good does this look? It is absolutely beautiful. I mean, you don't really see too much of that on uh, hardtail frames these days. Of course, De Kerf is a, a fairly specialist frame builder, um, handmade in Canada, and uh, this beautiful steel frame. And this, I quite like the uh, the tangerine color. It's pretty nice. I've got the salsa seat clamp up here, which is very nice. Chris King bottom bracket, Chris King headset, of course. Um, so I believe Ben's acquired this uh, secondhand. This is sort of a a bit of an eBay gold find. He's he's pretty good for that. I should probably pull out these. Uh, Shimano Airlines. This was something else that Ben had kicking around his workshop. Uh, anyone remember this? Does anyone remember airlines? Did you ever have, did you ever own airlines? Was this something that you lusted after and eventually got your hands on and then you were really impressed by how it all worked? And let me give you, yeah, there's one piece of the puzzle. There you go. You don't see too many of these around. So um, there you go. That's, that's the, uh, the airline system there. Uh, basically, not using cables, but compressed air to fire off the shift. So you'd need to put uh, pressurized air in this guy here, 
kind of like an Airshot tubeless thing these days. It's probably the same same can actually. They've just rebranded it. Um, but you put air, compressed air into this, and it will give you a certain amount of shifts. I want to say like 300 shifts off the top of my head. That number just popped into my head. It, someone can correct me on that. But yeah, you get a, a certain amount of um, air inside this can, and that will give you a certain amount of shifts uh, from the derailleur and shifter system, and all hooked up with uh, little pneumatic um, hoses. So yeah, pretty cool, huh? Um, there's lots of retro gold in here. So if you're a bit of a retro fan, let me know, and uh, we can organize to do a bit of a tour video one Friday, or perhaps on a Thursday, another day of the week. We can do a bit of a tour video around here, because there's... There's so much stuff that you can't see in this video, which if you're into retro things, you would absolutely love. So let me know if you'd like to see a video on that. We can do a bit of a workshop tour, have a bit of a look at some retro stuff and you can kind of tune in and tell us what you want to see and what you've got yourself as well if you're into retro bits and pieces. Something that's definitely not retro, um, I'm going to start by talking about um, this new goodie from Fox Racing Shocks that turned up this week, only a couple of days ago. This is super fresh. It was basically a secret up until a couple of days ago, so um, so I'm going to get cracking with some fresh goods. So fire away any questions you've got for me as they pop into your head, and I'll see if I can answer them for you. And let's have a bit of a chat about this one. Oof, that is a big old dropper post. This is, uh, you may have seen the video already earlier this week, this is a new dropper post from Fox Racing Shocks. There you go, I'm not lying, it is definitely Fox. Um, it's the transfer, but check out this uh, girth of this post. This is a 175 millimeter drop seat post. So previously Fox has done 100, 125 and 150 millimeter drop. This is a new um, version of the transfer. It's the new uh, 175 transfer. It's the longest dropper post that Fox has ever made. Now, longer stroke dropper posts, definitely in vogue uh, um, at the moment. There are a few brands that have been doing it for a while. Um, um, Bike Oak with the Revive dropper post, we tested one of those uh, about six months ago. They're 185 mil dropper. Um, I believe 9.8 do a 200 mil dropper. Um, there's another brand, Vecnum, I think, has been doing 200 mil dropper for a while. Callum is saying, one-up dropper is the best dropper I've used so far. That's a really um, good suggestion there, Callum. I've not had my hands on the one-up dropper post, but it gets a really good wrap. Now, you can adjust the travel on the one-up dropper, can't you? You can put shims inside, and you can actually lower the, the travel height or the, the actual physical um, height of the dropper post. Yeah, so he's giving me the thumbs up there. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the only drop post on the market that you can do that with? I have a feeling it might be. I can't think of any other post that you can do that with. Um, maybe 9.8 offers some sort of travel limitation thing, but with the one-up post, it's, it's quite easy to do, right? You've just got those plastic shims, crack it open, you add those, and they'll actually shorten the length of the drop post, um, or take them out if you want to extend it. So, um, so long travel drop post. Are you into this? Is this a thumbs up? Are you kind of into this? Um, super long drop, is that something that appeals to you? Um, Callum's saying you can put uh, the one-up shims in a Brand X dropper though. Oh, that's a really good little tip. So the same shims will fit in there. And will that actually drop the physical height of the post or will it just limit the travel? That's, um, that's one thing, because um, uh, I know Bontrager do shims that will limit the travel, but I don't think they'll actually change the, the overall length of the post, uh, which is crucial because or well, it's potentially important because um, I've actually got a test bike at the moment where the 150 mil dropper that's on there is slightly too long. So I basically got that slammed all the way down into the frame and that saddle height there is still a fraction too tall for me. So being able to put a shim in there and kind of drop that height would be amazing. Uh, it would mean that you wouldn't have to buy a whole new dropper pose. So. Um, reduces the travel. Oh, that's very good to know. So that's the Brand X dropper post. Brand X dropper post. There you go. Callum is informing us that you can modify the travel of a Brand X dropper post. Very good to know. We'd love to check that out for ourselves. Um, and I'd also love to check out that 1UP dropper. So if 1UP is watching this, hook us up. Um, anyway, we're talking about the transfer dropper here. These are available in two sizes. So you've got uh, 30.9 and 31.6. We've got the 31.6 here. 
Um, the total length is the same for both of those sizes. And you can also get this in, we've got the internal routed version here. So we've got the cable uh, pulled down the bottom of the post. You can also get this in an externally routed post where the cable mounts to the outside of the collar here. So if you've got a frame that doesn't have stealth routing or you have a bike that you'd rather run it externally, you don't want to run it through the frame and up the seat tube, which is fair enough, I get that. Um, oh, Robert has said, we have not seen any Cove bikes for some years. Um, that's slightly off topic, Robert. Uh, what do you mean by Cove bikes? Um, but yes, that's, that, you, yeah, no, you're not wrong. We haven't seen Cove, Cove bikes for some time. Um, but let me know what you mean. Are you talking about this? Because this is not a Cove bike, if that's what you're, what you're asking. This is a Decurf. Um, and it's not a fresh good. It's actually a, a very retro old good, um, which I was just chatting about before. But uh, let me know what you mean by Cove bikes. Um, so yes, so this transfer, um, I went through the details in a video before, and you can see the full news story on singletrackworld.com, which includes all the key measurements. The key measurements being the total length, uh, which I think is about 530 millimeters. Then this length here, uh, no, like Cove Stiffy. Uh, no, we haven't seen the, something like that for a while. Yeah, I don't know what the go is with Cove bikes, because of course they were quite in vogue, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, and they've kind of, as far as I'm aware, they're still kicking around, but, um, but they seem to have reduced their output, or they're certainly not as well known as they were uh, previously. Remember the hand job? That was a lovely steel trail frame. It was a really modern frame as well. Born on the North Shore, they're very quite slack head angle, you know, pretty radical kind of geometry at the time. Um, there was the hand job. What was the titanium one? Or was that the, the Hummer? That's the one. Uh, Shed Life Guy, I'm down to two brake lines now. Everything else is wireless. Right, right on, wireless. How are you running wireless, Shed Life Guy? I'm interested. I'm very interested. Uh, do you mean cable free or do you mean actually wireless? That will be, uh, yeah, what do, you, what, do you, what do you want about there? I'm very interested to find out what you mean by that. Um, right, pricing on this. Uh, in Australia, this will cost. Um, four hundred and seventy-nine dollars in the UK. This is three hundred and nineteen quid. So the price is unchanged over the one fifty, one twenty-five, one hundred mil travel version. So you, for the same price, you get more post, more travel, and more post. Shed life guy, Magura dropper, one by Bluetooth shifter. Whoa, that's crazy. What's the shifter and derailleur you've got there? The wireless shifter and derailleur. That's uh, is it that X shifter? Is that what you've got going? Bluetooth control. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Anything that reduces cables on a mountain bike is, is thumbs up from me, as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, you do get this um, post on its own. So you buy the post, and you can buy the lever separately. Or if you already have your own lever, you can, of course, BYO. We've been sent the race face uh, turbine, or sorry, race face one by lever. I think it used to be called the turbine lever. There you go, so a nice machine paddle. This is designed to sit under the bar in the way of your thumb, uh, which is quite nice. Ooh, Archer Campagnolo Shifter XT Derailleur. Archer Components Shifter XT Derailleur. Very cool. Oh, you've got loads of goodies you're talking about today, Shed Life Guy. I'm very interested in that. Archer Components, I will look that up after this video because I'm very, very interested in this Bluetooth wireless shifting. Very, very cool. All right, give us a thumbs up if you're into that. Um, Shed Life Guy, coming out with the gold today. Thank you very much. Um, right, so there you go. That's a drop post. Singletrackworld.com if you want more information on this. Um, I don't have it fitted onto a bike yet because I can't find one that fits. Um, my legs are a bit short and um, that means that a long travel drop post like this is kind of difficult to, uh, to fit to a bike because it does need to sit in the frame enough and then you also need enough exposed saddle hanging out of the frame. What is the most, uh, what's the most travel dropper you've tried? Is anyone out there running super long dropper posts? Or you kind of like, is 125 perfect for you and you don't want any more than that? Um, is there a reason why you wouldn't run, want to run a super long dropper post? Or do you just want as much as you can possibly get? Would, would, would a 300 mil dropper post kind of float your boat? Um, Shed Life Guy, I like shopping in Germany. They are light years ahead of the UK. Mm. All right, well, I, I won't make a comment on that because you know, politics and Germany and the UK at the moment are a bit sensitive. 
My one up is 170 on my new Capra 29er. Right on. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty into uh, after using a 160 or 170 mil dropper post. Um, I, I'm really into it. Get that saddle out of the way as far as I'm concerned. The, the further the better. Any news on an Eagle Wi-Fi setup? Asks Chris. No news. Um, I would honestly tell you if I knew. Um, I've been pestering SRAM for a reasonable while about this. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion it's probably coming in 2019. I think if you saw my predictions article for 2019 on the website, um, that was one of my predictions. I think Wi-Fi ETAP e Eagle surely has to be coming this year. Um, Nino Schurter, of course, has been on it for however many World Cup rounds last year. Um, we've also seen wireless reverb dropper post, uh, which will be very interesting to see how that pans out relative to the Magura Viron that Shed Life Guy is talking about. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how RockShox has gone about creating a wireless dropper post and how they've gone with the activation speed, which is uh, not a problem of the Magura Viron, but it's definitely a quirk that you either can get used to and you don't mind, or you hate. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how RockShox go about that. But wireless ETAP, I don't know. Um, my suspicion is we'll see it sometime this year, um, but we have no information on it. And I'm telling the honest, absolute honest truth, we have no information on that whatsoever. Um, so we're in the dark as much as you are. All we know is the spy photos that we've all seen online uh, from the World Cup, Nino Schurter. But um, fingers crossed we'll be seeing that this year. I'd be really interested to try that system. As I said before, anything that eliminates cables, Shed Life Guy's already onto it. He's well into the future with a Bluetooth shifter and a Shimano XT derailleur. Um, anything that gets rid of cables on a mountain bike, um, I'm all about. Um, cool. I want to talk about this, this little tool, um, because I reviewed this for singletrackworld.com uh, very recently, and I just wanted to give you a bit of a look at it because I think it's super neat. It's also super expensive. This tool is 50 pounds. I don't know what the Australian price is. I think the American price is $50, um, so 50 pounds for this. Oh, Shed Life Guy, I bet it will be expensive three or four years before SRAM is affordable. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that it will be expensive. Um, I mean, Red ETAP isn't exactly a cheap group set. That's the Rode wireless group set that, that SRAM currently has. Um, so I suspect that XX1 Eagle ETAP will, will be similarly priced. But then again, with Eagle ETAP, you don't have a front derailleur, do you? You've just got the shifter and the rear derailleur, so there's two components there. Um, so in theory, if we think that SRAM is gonna do what we think they're gonna do, which is just create a wireless shifter and derailleur. That would mean if you already own an Eagle group set, a one by 12 group set, then you just need to buy those two components because you already have the cassette, the chain, crank set, chain ring. So in theory, it's not a whole group set that you need to buy. Um, but as I said, this is that's pure speculation on my behalf. Maybe they're gonna go to 13 speed, who knows? Uh, well, Rota are already going to do that, um, and I did have an email from Rota actually a couple of months ago saying that they should have, in a couple of months' time, they should have that 13-speed hydraulic group set. Um, they're doing a 1x13. Is that a bit crazy to you guys, a 13-speed cassette? I think it was, I want to say 10 to 52 or 10 to 53, I think. It's humongous. That's a big old cassette on the back of the bike there. Um, is 13 speed going a little bit too far? Tell me what you think um, while we're talking about gears here. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about this. This is too crazy. Yeah, yeah. So PR Roz is not a fan too much. Um, it's surely the next step though, isn't it? Like the, this is the thing with drivetrains is you have eight speed and then a couple of years later you have nine speed and then it trickles down through the group set. And then your next innovation is let's do 10 speed, 11 speed. We're up to 12 speed now. Of course, Shimano have brought out a 12-speed XTR, which is sort of still becoming available as we speak. Um, so yeah, is the inevitable step 13-speed? Maybe 14-speed? I think Shimano might even hold a patent on a 14-speed cassette. Two by 11, it's enough, says PR Roz. Yeah, I think the uh, thing with drivetrain is you've got to get what works for you, um, whether that's a double, a single, a triple, um, 10, 11, 12-speed, whatever. Um, Callum says, now nah, pinion gearbox is the future, I hope. Um, I've ridden a couple of pinion gearboxes and they are, they are fantastic. They're beautiful pieces of engineering, for sure. They're, they're very, very meticulously built 
And uh, as far as maintenance goes, you really don't have to do a whole lot with those things. The shifter leaves a bit to be desired though, because you've got that rotary grip shifter and there's a, there, there's a certain method for shifting. You have to back off the power before you shift, which can be quite tricky on the climbs. And uh, friends that I know who own a bike with a pinion gearbox, they say you just get used to it and you just deal with it and you, you modify your technique and it's, and it's absolutely fine. But how cool would this be, a pinion gearbox with a wireless trigger shifter? I reckon that would be pretty, pretty shit hot to be perfectly honest. Um, because a trigger shifter, that's what a lot of mountain bikers want. Grip shift, that's a smaller niche, I think. And a lot of people get turned off the pinion gearbox because of the, the rotary grip shifter. Um, so if they could develop a trigger shifter, and I understand the difficulty with that is you need two cables coming out of the shifter, um, which is why the rotary system works because you're pulling cable both directions as you're shifting up or down. Um, so how they would do that with a trigger shifter that's wireless, I've got no idea, but hey, they're German, they should be able to work it out. Paul J, if it helps me up the hills, I'm fine with it. Agreed. Yeah, if uh, lower gears all the way, especially with tires getting bigger, wheels getting bigger, um, bikes in general getting, I think, a little heavier than they have been in the past few years as they're getting more robust and more capable. Lower gears, thank you very much. It would be nice if someone retro-engineered the Honda downhill bike gearbox, says Shed Life Guy. Oh yeah, that would be super cool. Mind you, that, that was just a derailleur in a can, wasn't it? Um, it turned out that when, uh, when they eventually showed the world what, the, what was going on with that Honda R RN01 downhill bike, it's just a derailleur in a can. Or maybe that's what they wanted us to think. And maybe it was actually a hamster inside there changing gears on its own. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, they were very secretive about it all anyway. Um, yeah, I would love to see that, that technology uh, developed and advanced. Um, but with a lot of these big brands like SRAM and Shimano, they have so much invested in external drivetrains and they're kind of refining a product that already works pretty well. Um, I think most of us have external drivetrains on our bikes and I don't really have too many issues with it. And that's kind of where they're going with that, to reinvest in internal um, uh, gearbox, whether that's bottom bracket based or hub based. There's a lot of development involved there, but um, yeah, maybe we'll see some other players aside from Pinion get involved. Um, oh, we've got another question come through. Hey, Shed Life Guy, how does the D1X go? Any good? That's Chris asking Shed Life Guy a question. You can, uh, you can answer that uh, if you like, Shed Life Guy. Um, so I've got this uh, little tool in my hands and I'll talk about it rather than just fondling it, fondling it endlessly. Um, so this is from Fix It Sticks. How cool is this? So these are two sticks. This is kind of their whole, their whole shtick. <laughs> um, and these, it's, it's a multi-tool essentially, but rather than being, you know, the little flip out style multi-tool that we, that we all know and probably all use, um, it's designed like a T-bar workshop tool. So you basically swap your bits around and you can use it like a T-bar. So this is really functional. I really like using this on the trail, especially um, when you're trying to access like awkward bo um, bottle cage bolts or you're trying to access um, brake lever reach bolts, anything that's kind of awkward and fiddly, this is fantastic because the, um, the length of the T-bar is quite long. I think it's nearly 90 millimeters. And so that means you can get into quite awkward positions, which a standard flip out multi-tool has a really difficult time doing. So um, the whole design of this is really neat. They do a whole bunch of different products and this is their most comprehensive. It's called the Mountain Kit and it comes in this neat little holster and see if you can hear this. Oh, I love that sound. Everything clicks into place nicely. Uh, it comes in this neat little sort of zippy bag, carry bag. And the idea with these bits is they're actually magnetic. So, oh, uh, PR Roz is saying, that's cool, I'm gonna buy that tool. And he's given this the, uh, the okay emoji. Yeah, yeah, it is really neat. I like it. It's expensive, don't get me wrong, um, but it's super high quality and you can just tell that by the feel in your hands. It's made to, really, um, made to a really high uh, standard. Um, so yeah, so you can actually pull these bits out and you hear that? There you go. So that's the uh, magnetic bit there. And so far, touch wood, I haven't had any of the bits drop out on me on the trail, which is kind of the risk that you have with uh, a removable bit. Um, but the hold there is, I've found, 
totally substantial enough um, that I haven't dropped any of these on the trail. Um, Pierre Rose is saying, in Poland we say, oh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I want to know what that phrase means and I'm not going to try and pronounce that because I, I just don't want to offend uh, anyone. <laughs> um, and with the, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm a white English speaking person. I don't know any other languages aside from English. And even then I don't speak it very well. Um, I'm stupid basically. So uh, let, let me know what that means. Um, you do get all these other bits with it. So I think in total there are, uh, we have a two millimeter, a 2.5 millimeter. We have a three millimeter a four millimeter, a five millimeter, and a six millimeter hex bit. And we have a uh, T25 Torx bit on here, and a Phillips head screwdriver bit there as well. So you kind of have everything you really need for most bikes. The only thing that's missing, which I would like to see added, is an eight millimeter hex bolt, particularly for traveling when you need to take pedals on and off. If you're putting your bike into a box, um, or perhaps traveling in the back of a car, or you're taking on a train or a plane or whatever, um, an eight millimeter hex would be a good addition. But the good news for this is these bits are a standard size. So you can go into your local hardware store and in theory, you should be able to buy standard bits that will slot into here. And you've got your carry case there. So any extra bits you get, you can just stow them in there. And um, so I'm gonna go get an eight millimeter bit, hopefully this weekend to add to my Fix It Sticks Mountain Kit, um, because that's the only thing I think it's missing. Um, I'll show you what else is in this little carry case. We'll have a couple of questions come through. PR Roz, I'm white too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shed Life Guide. There was a cassette and derailleur in there with a friction clutch, unlike the pinion you can shift while stationary. And the D1X is flawless. 30 minutes to fit, adjust with the app, and the shift is so quiet. So that is the wireless, Bluetooth wireless shifter and derailleur that Shed Life Guy is talking about. So. I'm, after this video, I'm going to go check that out. That's, um, that is super cool. Thank you very much for letting us know um, about some cool new products that, um, that up until the start of this video, I had no idea existed. I knew about the X Shifter, which I think is an American guy who maybe used to work with SRAM. Um, I can't remember, I think it was um, an X SRAM guy who's developed a wireless shifter system called X Shifter, but it uses a standard cable derailleur and the cable comes out of the mech and then it goes into a receiver and this is a little... Um, wireless um, box that basically pulls the cable or releases the cable. So it still uses the cable up until that point and then it's Bluetooth up until the shifter and that's where it's, uh, you've got the wireless shifter. Shed Life Guy, I bought mine because you guys were supposed to rate it. Oh, that's news to me. <laughs> I've not actually seen that. When, when was that review? Because that might have been before my time at Single Track perhaps. Um, I'm very interested about this D1 um, shifter business though. I'm going to show you, while we're uh, waiting for that response, I'm going to show you this tie levers that come with this kit. This is super cool as well. So you've got magnetic tie levers that clip onto the end of this. So there we go. And again, there's a little magnet in there that sucks it into place. And that's actually quite firm. Believe it or not, these are some of the best tie levers I've ever used. And they're in this little multi-tool kit, you know, they're not dedicated tie levers, um, but they're really nice fat kind of blade, quite thin, got a really good hooked profile to them. And because this is metal reinforced, well, it's obviously uh, an alloy carrier that we have here, because you've got that metal axle, it's got quite a bit of um, extra uh, rigidity through it rather than a full plastic tie lever. So it helps to reinforce it makes it a bit stiffer, and I found it's really, really easy to get tires on and off. So these tie levers are absolutely fantastic, and I actually use them in my workshop, not just in my backpack out on the trail. Um, these are probably some of the best I've used. So those come with the pack, and we also have, oh, this is also super cool, is, let's see if I can get this, chain breaker. And it's, you wouldn't think that's a chain breaker, um, but it is, I'm gonna show you how. So we build it as a lot of the fix it sticks tools do. You actually um, whack one of the sticks onto the end. So this is your handle, uh, sorry, this is your holder and this is your handle or driver for driving the chain pin. So you can actually use that to get extra torque. Cause you know what, normally multi-tools that have a chain breaker on them, they've got tiny little arms and they're a bit fiddly. And um, I've actually had the pins break on some as well. They're a bit flimsy and a bit of an afterthought to be perfectly honest. Um, this is 
this is much more robust and much easier to get a good amount of torque and force onto that chain pin driver. So uh, it's basically a, a, a little, um, a little, <clears throat> excuse me, um, modular chain tool. So uh, that comes in the kit as well. So super neat and uh, turns this kind of fix it stick system into a really versatile bit of kit. So let me know if you're into that. Thumbs up on the, um, on the fix it sticks multi-tool. It's called the mountain kit and this is the, the biggest kit that they do. So it's basically got the most tools possible. Um, if you'd like to read more about this, jump on singletrackworld.com and search for fix it sticks. And my review went up, I don't know, uh, a week or two ago, and uh, I rate this. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Very, very nice to use. Not cheap, I think it's about 50 quid in the UK. Um, so there you go, I'll put that back in the zipper. Stow that away, and uh, let me know if you've got any questions about that. We've just had a couple more questions come through. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Ah, Shed Life Guy is saying, about six or seven months ago, it was an article on your website. Oh. Uh, that might not have been my article. Maybe it was, and I've just completely had a brain melt on it. Um, to be honest, everything is melting at the moment. It's really, really hot. So <laughs> you'll have to forgive me if I've made a mistake there. Um, but I'm not too familiar with it, to be honest. Um, I'll have to have a look. We do publish a lot of stories on the website, and there's, I think there's about three or four of us that, um, that work on stories for singletrackworld.com. So depending on who's in the office at the time, um, might mean six or seven months ago. That would have been July. I might have been away at that point. I might have been away on holiday. So, but I'm going to look at that. Thank you very much. You've pointed to a, um, to a very good resource that apparently is on the website that I work for. So <laughs> I'm going to go have a look and find out some more about that. Thanks, Shed Life Guy. Um, the last thing I want to talk about are these glasses, which I've been riding for about six or seven months. Um, and I have very luckily have two pairs of these to play around with. And I want to show you this because while we're kind of talking about um, neat kind of modular magnetic clip-in tools, we should probably talk about these neat modular magnetic clip-in glasses as well from Smith Optics. Um, now, these are also equally expensive. I think they're 190 quid in the UK. In Australia, they're $369 for a pair of glasses. Mind you, you do get two lenses, so I guess you could say you're getting two pairs of glasses uh, for the price of one very expensive uh, pair of glasses. So I'll show you this case because this is quite neat. So this is, <coughs> this is what you, uh, you get with your glasses, uh, zip out case, that's pretty standard. But uh, we've got the arms separate here. We've got two lenses in the pack as well. And we've got two different tin lenses, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and basically, when you pull the main lens out of here, the idea is that you build your glasses. So they're kind of like little transformer glasses. And I'll see if I can show you this here, but on the side of the glasses, there we go, we've got a little bar here, a little hollow um, connection. And on the arm, we have a corresponding latch, and that is held in place by a magnet. So if we push these two together, there we go. See that clip in place? And that is now attached. We'll do the same on this side and clip that in place. If it goes, there we go. So that's all clipped in. So there you go. Those are your Smith Attack Max glasses. Now there are a few different models from Smith that use this technology. It's a very neat way of being able to offer interchangeable lenses. Um, it does mean every time that you take your glasses out of the case, you have to build them. You have to construct your glasses. Personally, I find it quite satisfying, so I'm okay with that. Um, but to release them, let's show you here, there is a little tab on here, and you basically open that. You can see that pop open, and it clips out. Simple as that. So really easy to do, um, really easy to swap lenses when you need to. These are the Attack Max, so they're pretty huge. Let me put those on. Whoa, that's pretty, um, that's pretty fierce look right there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> These are huge lenses. They do a standard attack lens, which is uh, a little shallower than this. This is a pretty deep profile lens. Got really nice curvature there as well. Um, you've got adjustable nose pieces. So there's a rubber nose piece here, and you can clip those together, and that'll basically sit the glass a little bit further up your nose, or you can pop those out, 
and that'll bring the glasses a little bit closer to your eyes and your eyebrows and you can potentially drop them down a little bit. So it's basically a, a fit system, allows you to kind of tweak the, uh, the fit of those glasses, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll show you the other lens that we have here. This is a rose tint lens. So you can see that's much more clear. This is a green mirror finish lens. So this is for your bright summery conditions and this is for your overcast kind of wintry days um, or autumn days perhaps. Perfect for the UK right about now, I think, these lenses. Both of these use what Smith call chromapop technology. Now, the easiest, the way I like to describe this is it's like looking through an Instagram filter. Um, it makes everything look really bright and colorful and there's loads of contrast. Uh, it just makes everything look better, really. Greens are much greener, um, browns are much earthier. Um, you get really good color boosting kind of profile to it. So um, it's quite pleasant to use, to be honest. The other feature about um, Chromapop is the idea is that it filters certain wavelengths that your eyes and your brain find a little bit confusing. So certain colors that, uh, that I'm gonna get the technical part of this <laughs> wrong because I don't have the information right in front of me, um, but certain wavelengths that are, I've got it written down here, um, that provide confusion to your brain that can be more fatiguing um, these filter those wavelengths out and the idea is to basically make it easier to see. Um, now, I, I don't know, if, you, if you're wearing your glasses for hours on end, that's probably um, going to be more of a difference for you. I reach for these glasses all the time though, I really like them. I like the clear clarity of them. Um, they don't scratch very easily, which is something that a lot of high-end glasses have issues with. Um, these lenses have lasted really well and for bright conditions, this green lens is really good and the rose tint lens is good for uh, overcast conditions. Shed Life Guy, they're really cool glasses, but I'm probably going with goggles for the next few weeks. <laughs> good news, Shed Life Guy, we have a goggle group test coming at the moment. Uh, Rob Mitchell's working on a goggle group test. Um, we've got, I think, six pairs of different goggles, and uh, we requested all of them in a British winter-friendly tint. So, um, so might have some good information for you there. Um, yeah, and to be honest, I could probably do with goggles at the moment because the trails are dusty and not in a good way. When I say that, I mean honestly in a bad way. Like if you go on a group ride and you're seven riders deep at the back, you can barely see anything and you basically spend the next 24 hours coughing out, uh, coughing out dust. Oh, Jack Adler's tuning in, just got in, name of the glasses. These are Smith Attack Max, so you can see the Smith logo on the side there. These are the Attack Max glasses, they also make the regular Max, which is basically the same thing, but the lens is a bit smaller. And I think there's a few other models from Smith Glasses. Uh, no, nope, Jack's just said thanks. No worries, Jack. Um, Smith makes a couple of other glasses, different styles with the same technology. So we were just talking about this, and I'm gonna show you now how we swap the lenses. You actually remove the arms from the frame. So you pop up that latch, that pulls out. So there's a magnet inside here, that's pretty cool. Um, we'll do the other one here as well. So you can see the latch at the top there, and when we flick that open, the arm just pulls straight off. Um, now I should point out that I've never had the arms accidentally detached, they're solid as a rock. You really have to, uh, well, that will only open when you've got the arm closed like that, is the only time you can open that latch. So when the, when the arm is like this, it's not going anywhere. So you have to close it, pop that latch and pull it open. And the last thing you have to do is we have to remove the nose piece, and you basically pinch that and just drag it down out of the lens. So really simple, we swap the lenses around. I'll put this rose tint lens. So you put the nose bridge into the arch of the lens and that'll pop up there. Jack's asking very cool price. Now you're in the States, aren't you Jack? Um, I don't think I have American pricing. I can only tell you British and, uh, and Australian pricing. Australian pricing is $370. So my rough guesstimate is I don't know, is it gotta be 250 bucks US? Um, I know if you go onto the Smith Optics website, smithoptics.com, I think, and you'll be in the American region, go to, yeah, really expensive, I know. <laughs> Not cheap whatsoever. We were just talking before about how good the lenses are and the technology that's in them. But if you're the sort of person that leaves your glasses on your car seat and then you sit on them and break them, you probably don't want these glasses. <laughs> That's an expensive mistake. <laughs> um, but I've been using these for the past seven months now, I think. Geez, even longer than that, I think. Um, maybe nine months. And 
What I've been really impressed with these is just how good the lenses are and the fact that they're not scratched to the wazoo, which normally happens even with really expensive glasses. Oakley's Adidas are terrible for it. I've got a couple of pairs of those and they're great fitting lenses, great coverage, um, great profile as well. Really nice clear crystal, crystal clear vision. Um, but the lenses scratch really easily and uh, there's a pair I was testing recently and they must have been close to $400. So um, yeah, not cheap. These are equally not cheap, um, but in my experience, the quality is there. So if you want a really nice lens, um, if you want a really good fitting glass, you want that uh, removable system. As I said, it comes with both of those lenses and these are the Chroma Pop tint lens. So they're very, very high quality. They've got that uh, contrast boosting effect. Um, very, very nice glasses to wear, that's for sure. Very light too put that on there. That's, that's pretty scary. <laughs> Without the helmet and the bike, it does look pretty weird. So. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you want to read more about that, my reviews on singletrackworld.com, just search for Smith and it should be the first review that pops up. And I've wrote a really detailed review about the lens tech, my experience with it, and also a weird effect that happens with this rose tint lens. So if you want to know more about these Smith Attack Max glasses, jump on the website, search for that and you'll be able to find my review. Um, right, so that kind of brings us to the end of the fresh products here. Um, some general news for you guys um, about uh, what's been happening in the mountain bike world the past couple of weeks. Did anyone see the launch of the Canyon Strive yesterday? So Canyon has brought out a brand new enduro bike, uh, the Strive. They already had that bike in their lineup. I think it was about four years old, perhaps. They've just brought out a completely revamped model, the Strive. Let me know what you think of that bike. Um, there's a lot of changes on it. It's got a new shapeshifter system. It's running on 29 inch wheels. It's a purebred enduro race bike. The previous Strive was very, very successful on the Enduro World Series. So I'm sure Canyon is hoping that the new version is gonna be equally or more successful. Um, Andy actually, our Andy from the office went to the launch. He went to Malaga in Spain and rode the Strive, and he actually rode them on trails that he's ridden before on several different bikes, which normally doesn't happen with a launch. So he had a really good reference point for what the trails are like and what his other bikes have performed like on those trails. So he had a really good reference point for testing the Strive. Um, and his first rider review is now live on the website right now. So if you wanna know a bit more about that Strive, there is a news story about it with all the spec pricing information, and there's also a first rider review. Uh, Jack is saying Ratboy is on it also. On the Canyon? No, he's on Cannondale. He's on the uh, Cannondale Habit, is he not? Um, Shed Life Guy, did you see the pictures of the e-sender? An e-bike sender. So that's Canyon's downhill bike with a motor and a battery. Jack said, right, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an easy mistake to make, uh, to be honest, especially a lot of modern mountain bikes start looking the same, so <laughs> yeah. Um, but Shared Life Guy's just talking about, uh, presumably, some leaked photos of an e-sender. Was it a bodge job, or is it a proper, like, uh, prototype mule that Canyon is testing? Um, E-downhill bikes, I think, are the best idea for an e-bike. I think rather than relying on um, a dirty big four-wheel drive or van to drive you up the hill, um, to be able to pedal away on an electric bike to get you up to the top of the hill and do your downhill run. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You don't need a chairlift or whatever. Um, so it's basically you know, self-powered uplift riding. Um, I actually know here in Bendigo, there's a mountain bike park called uh, the Harcourt Mountain Bike Park and loads of downhillers and enduro riders are getting onto these new long travel e-bikes and that's their training. They can get in you know, a dozen runs, whereas before they would only get in four or five runs. So, because you can pedal up on your own speed and then descend down again, makes a lot of sense for, for downhillers and enduro riders to get in that extra descending time. Uh, right, so Callum's saying, I think they could have pushed the geo a bit further on the Strive, especially with the shapeshifter. Callum, I would agree with you on paper. I've not ridden the bike, so I, I couldn't tell you what it's like on the trail. Sometimes the, the ride on the trail is a bit different to what the geometry looks like on paper. I've had that with a few bikes where they've really surprised me with, um, with how well they've ridden on the trail. The Specialized Stump Jump is a great example. Not super slack, not super long, but a really, really good bike. Um, so totally surprised me on the geometry. So maybe the Strive is like that. I don't know, Andy was really impressed with it. He rode the large, and he's kind of borderline medium and large. He rode the large frame at the launch, 
and he said the geometry was great. So um, he, he was a big fan of it, but, um, but uh, I've, I've not ridden one myself. But initially I would agree with you about the geometry. They probably could have pushed the envelope a bit further. And as you said, with the shapeshifter system, you've got that remote, so you can kind of, um, you've got your climbing and your descending position. So in theory, you could kind of make that difference bigger. So your descending geometry could be really slack um, and quite low, and your climbing geometry could be much steeper. Um, Canyon's gone for, I think it's one and a half degree. So when you flick between modes, you go from 66 degree head angle uh, to a 67.5 degree head angle. So uh, one and a half degrees. So is that enough? I don't know. Um, I'd love to, to ride one myself. I really like the Scott Ransom that I tested last year and that has a similar handlebar um, suspension system called the twin lock. And that actually changes the shock behavior which alters the geometry of the bike. And again, it wasn't a huge change. I think it was only a degree and a half in the head and seat angle that it steepens when you put it into the climbing uh, traction control position but it made a huge difference on the trail. More bottom bracket clearance, so you could pedal up rough stuff. It was a really good system, so maybe it is enough, I don't know. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to read more about that bike, singletrackworld.com. Um, the other new bike that's come out last week is the YT Jeffsy, so also a German direct-to-consumer brand. Has anyone seen the new YT Jeffsy? Um, going back to Jack's comment about Ratboy and the Cannondale Habit, Camdale Habit, YT Jeffsy, very similar looking bikes. Um, but the, the Jeffsy has changed. It looks very similar, but there's been lots of changes there with the geometry and suspension. They've got 29 and 27.5 version. I think it's around 150 to 160 millimeters of travel. Uh, the Jeffsy, I imagine, is going to be a very popular bike. YT, very aggressive on pricing and uh, very good at marketing as well. Did anyone see the Christopher Walken video? I'm, I'm still not convinced by that video, but very impressive. Um, clearly, they have a lot of money to be able to employ Christopher Walken to do videos for them. Callum's saying the Jeffsy looks brilliant, like a mini Capra now. Yeah, it does look pretty, pretty chunky, doesn't it? That big kind of head tube, down tube section. Um, very robust looking bike. The geometry does look great on that as well. So I'm sure they've built um, a really, really good bike. Jack saying, yes, love the ad. Yeah, it was, it's unlike any other mountain bike ad, I think. More cowbells, yes. <laughs> I really wanted to see Christopher Walken dance in that video. After I watched that, that YT Jeffsy commercial with Christopher Walken, I immediately watched Fatboy Slim Weapon of Choice film clip. Oh my gosh, that dancing in that film clip is amazing. Hmm, <laughs> it's that German thing again. Yeah, I think so, I think so. <laughs> Um, right, and uh, any if you're also looking for other stories to read, um, if this has got you fired up for mountain biking, um, David's just done a review of the Cane Creek Helm Coil Fork. Now, David previously tested the Helm Air. Cane Creek has released a coil sprung version. He's ridden it for about seven months now. So if you're interested in suspension forks and brands other than RockShox and Fox, you want to have a look at that review. Very, very interesting. Um, Callum is saying I have the Capra and would go for the new Jeff seat if I was buying now. I, th I think that's a fair point. I think the Capra is sort of almost like a mini downhill bike now. Would, would, you, would you agree? It's a pretty beefy, slack kind of long, long old thing, whereas the Jeff C is kind of going into more of that enduro race bike sort of spectrum. Um, so yeah, interesting point about how the Jeff C and the Capra have kind of evolved over the last few years. Um, and the last thing I want to tell you about is, this is more relevant to UK viewers, but there's a story that went live on our website, for me overnight, but for you guys during the day on Thursday. There's an event called the Wales 360. Now this is a new multi-day mountain bike event, and they're saying it's kind of like, they're going for the BC Bike Race, Cape Epic type vibe. So it's seven days, uh, six days of racing, um, seven nights of accommodation, you stay in like a luxury camp um, or there's also hotel accommodation, all foods provided, all drinks provided. You get local food, local beers, um, you get fully supported riding. You basically turn up to this event and you don't need to bring your wallet. You just bring your bike, your riding kit and a good attitude and, uh, and a thirst for adventure. And it goes through mid and north Wales. I was reading about it yesterday and it sounds pretty damn cool. And the cool thing is that we've got a pairs entry to give away and it's worth 2,600 pounds. So that's a pairs entry. An individual entry is 1,310 pounds because it is kind of a, not just a race, it's a big riding holiday as well. So if you're looking for something to do in summer, in July, then have a look at the Wales 360. But more importantly, if you're 
even remotely interested in it, go on our website right now because we have a competition. It's free to enter. You just answer one question by watching their um, promotional video. Answer the question and you'll be in the entry to win £2,600 worth of entry fee um, to go to the Wales 360. So that is pretty cool. Uh, just had a comment come through from Callum. Isn't it capable of running triple crown forks, says Shed Life Guy? Yes, the Capra is. In fact, it may be the only 29er enduro bike that is rated to run a triple crown downhill fork. Dual crown downhill fork. Triple clamp. Now we're getting confused. <laughs> um, dual crown downhill fork. Yes, I think you're right. And something like, uh, what is the MRP fork? The Bartlett. I think that would be a fantastic addition to something like a 29er Capra. Uh, basically, this is a downhill bike really at that point, uh, which would be pretty damn cool. So. Uh, yes, we're just talking about the YT Jeff C that's brand new. If you want to read that story, jump on singletrackworld.com. We also have the new story, first ride review of the Canyon Strive, which was launched yesterday uh, or last night for me. It was uh, brand new. There's a big story on that um, and a whole bunch of other stuff on the website if you guys want to have a look at that. Um, I'm going to go and uh, I think I'm going to get out on that Giant Trance 29 that we were talking about last week. Made a few tweaks to that bike and it's starting to come good. So. Um, I also went out and filmed a onboard ride review. So I had the GoPro on the chest mount and I had a lapel microphone and I basically went riding around the, the bush in Bendigo just yelling at myself in the bush. And uh, we should have that edited soon so we'll give you a bit of, a, bit of an impression of what the bike's like and, uh, and also see me maybe crash. Um, Shed Life Guy, I'm running the Bartlett but there is another delay on the hazard coil. Oh, sad face. Oh, the Bartlett looks like a good fork, and the Hazard also looks like a great shock. And it's kind of that beyond Duro segment, so sort of long travel enduro bordering on mini downhill kind of thing, and that coil sprung suspension, all about it. Uh, Callum is saying, you put those funky bars on it? I did. I did actually put those funky bars on it. I've taken them off, and I've put the standard Canyon handlebar and stem back on. Oh, hold on. Are we talking about the trance? No, the trance, I've left the regular bar and stem. I haven't messed around with that cockpit at all yet. The Canyon, I've put the Syncross Hickson bars on. Um, that's been quite interesting. So I have a full review of that. Going to have a live ride review of the Canyon coming soon as well. So if you've got any questions about that Canyon you're on, let me know and uh, we'll hopefully answer them for you. Um, but yes, I'm going to head off. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend of riding planned or eating and drinking, catching up with friends, doing whatever you like to do on your weekends. Um, I'm also going to get out for a bike ride. I'm going to do a big social ride on Sunday morning called Dirt Church, which is uh, a fantastic, uh, usually 40 kilometer off-road ride through uh, the forest of Bendigo. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'll be doing it every Sunday for the past few weeks and great to ride in a big group of 20 or 25 riders. So uh, I'll be doing that on Sunday. So I hope you've got plenty of riding planned for the weekend. And uh, Jack's giving us a cheers. Cheers, Jack. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching and thanks for uh, commenting and, and asking questions. Love it when you guys tune in. Um, and uh, I reckon next time we do a video, I think we'll have a bit more of a look at all these retro goodies that we've got up here. You can't see a lot of them, but I think you're going to be really interested in them. I'll have to get Ben in here and we'll do a bit of a tour of his workshop. And uh, we'll look at some of these very cool bikes we've got kicking around here. All right, I'm going to head off. And uh, as always, if you've got any questions, I'll be looking at the comments after the video goes live. So uh, Shed Life Guy, see you next week, mate. See ya, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning every week. We really appreciate it. And um, as always, if you've got any suggestions about stuff you wanna see and, and talk about, let me know. I'd love to, uh, to help out. And um, we'll see you next week for, for more YouTube videos. All right, guys, I'll uh, see you then.